Hello Internet, Mike Bartolini here. Back playing another episode of Cthulhu Chronicles. Um, I hope you're enjoying this. I'm going to try to play through all of them. See how I do in these adventures. Maybe get some ideas for upcoming scenarios that I run on tabletop for Call of Cthulhu. Let's get to it. Chapter 3. Um, let's see. He's... Bobby Zier. Detective. A veteran of the Great War, Robert tried his hand at many things after demobilization before finally settling into a career as a private detective. It earned him more money than his gruff demeanor didn't scare off most of his would-be clients. He hopes to have an easier time at Arkham, where there are more people desperate enough to hire him and more speakeasies to supply him with alcohol. It seems your successful investigation into the late Rupert Merriweather's affairs did not go unnoticed. This morning, your mailbox actually contains a letter from Miss Kutonic University, no less. Inside is neither a commendation nor a payment. Rather, the envelope contains an invitation. Apparently, the dean of the university would like to speak with you. The rest of the letter is purposely vague, leaving you with no real information on what the meeting will be about. It promises payment, though, and that's more than enough to entice you. Miskatonic University isn't impressive on the outside as it is from the outside. The stately building houses, so many twisting corridors and golden lettered doors that you get a bit lost. Eventually, though, you find the right room and step into the dean's office. Dean Fallon is a short trim man to whom middle age has clearly been kind. He looks up and smiles as you enter and gestures for you to take the seat on the other side of the desk. I apologize for the vagueness of my letter, Dean says. He folds his hands in the desk before him. But it was necessary to avoid leaking sensitive information should the letter be intercepted. He pauses for a moment and continues slowly and deliberately. Recently, the university's private collection suffered a loss of inventory. I was hoping you might help us track down the culprit and reclaim the lost item. The item in question is a book, about a foot across and six inches thick. Hard to miss. As for the culprit, all I can tell you is that he was a man, close to six feet tall, with short, dark brown hair. We realize that the case is a difficult one to pursue, given the scarcity of information, the dean says smoothly, but the university is prepared to offer you a handsome sum for the recovery of the stolen book, should you succeed. Will you take the case? You politely ask the dean why he hasn't just gone to the police for help. The dean gives you a flat look. The police are a public task force. We can't afford for this to become a public matter. Now, do you want the job or not? Excellent, the dean says without batting an eye. You begin immediately. I trust you will work quickly. The sooner you find and return the book, the sooner you will be compensated for your work. And if you take too long, he says blithely, you can, we can always hire another investigator. Oh, 
Good, the dean says, standing from his seat. I'm sure I don't have to remind you, but this is a very sensitive matter. Your discretion is key. He opens the door after you. Goodbye, and good luck. You walk out of the university, and you use the time to turn the dean's words over in your head. A buck too big to easily hide, a completely unremarkable thief, an increasingly cold trail. The case is certainly an odd one. You are reluctant to admit it, even to yourself, but you have no idea where to begin. Excuse me, someone says, as you walk to the university's main entrance. The speaker is a young woman with neatly coughed brown hair and pale skin. A turquoise brooch leans inside her throat. She smiles politely when you meet her gaze, and her blue eyes shine with eager interest. I'm Professor Lita, she says, extending a hand. And I believe you've just been hired. You're the investigator of the dean just said. The professor's smile widens. Her hands grip and just tightens for a moment, then release just as quickly. A pleasure to meet you. I'm glad I caught you before you left. I'd like to help with the investigation. The professor beams at you. Thank you. The dean doesn't think you should be getting help. But luckily for you, I think getting to the bottom of this as quickly as possible is more important than making you earn the reward money. She starts walking off toward the street corner, and you hurry to keep up. I know who did it, and where he was last seen. It's halfway across town, so we should get there just after noon if we hurry. Professor Lita leads you down block after block of bustling streets, and slowly the city around you shifts in appearance. Office buildings shrink down and are replaced by small neighborhood shops, townhomes give way to apartments, buildings, then boarding houses. You finally come to stop in front of one such boarding house. It's just on the edge of Federal Hill, near the Italian neighborhood. The outside of the building isn't much to look at, and you doubt the inside will be any different. The door opens after a few rapid knocks. A scowling woman appears out at the two of you, her eyes surprisingly faintly as they look the two of you up and down. You're here for God now, she asks. The woman nods decisively. Dear it! No one wearing clothes like yours comes to my shanks unless there's trouble. And that's all that man ever was. Ma Shank shuffles back into her boarding house, leaving the door open behind her. It takes you a moment to realize she means for you to follow her inside. Ma Shanks leads you past a small living room up to the second floor, and then past up to the third. The wood floors are creaky, and the sparse throw rugs are so worn their patterns are completely gone. Ma Shanks makes a beeline for one of the three doors in the hallway and pulls a keychain from the folds of her skirt to unlock it. The room beyond it is a wreck. What little you can see from the hallway is more than enough to paint a vivid picture of what happened. Don't take that thing, Ma Shanks says and shuffles back down the hall, leaving you and Professor Leader alone with the apartment. You step lightly over the threshold, avoiding bits of broken glass and splintered wood. Professor Leader follows close behind. The room is even more of a mess once you can see the whole thing. The only piece of furniture that hasn't been entirely ruined is the bed. Everything else upside down or broken. Or both. The far wall is a mess of long gashes and the window is shattered. Well, Professor Leader says brightly, at least we'll have some fresh air while we investigate a potential murder scene. There's so much to look at in the room that you almost don't know where to start. The floor is covered with debris, and the few items that are on the floor are stowed on a bookshelf opposite the window. The floor is, as noted earlier, a complete mess. You scan it carefully, looking for anything out of place. Well, anything more out of place than everything else. It's just a jumble of broken furniture and knickknacks and clothing. But then your eyes catch on a surprisingly valuable looking onyx figurine of a cat. You 
try to be covert, but you can feel Leader's eyes on you. You turn, trying to look casual, like you just hadn't tried to steal something from a crime scene without her noticing. She doesn't look particularly bothered, though, and she drives her nonchalance home with a shrug. As far as I'm concerned, stealing from a thief is barely a crime at all. It's practically justice. With that, she purposely turns away to stare out the window. You pocket the statue and wonder what the other professors in Miskatonic must be like. The window pane is almost completely gone. Only a few fragments of glass still cling to the wood frame. Those long cut into the wall overlap the window, adding to the destruction. Professor Leader is already examining that with particular interest. The view from the window is nothing spectacular, unless you're a big fan of corner groceries and flower vendors. I've been thinking about these, Professor Leader says as you join her. They actually remind me of the scratches my cat used to leave on the walls at home. But that's ridiculous, she hastens to add, flushing. She stumbles off to look at something else, murmuring to herself about stupid and cats as she goes. The professor's line of thought is actually pretty similar to your own, but you have in mind something much worse than a cat in mind. I'm glad I didn't try to come here alone, Professor Leader says. I got next to nothing out of that crime scene. I suppose there's a reason that Dean wanted to hire someone with investigative experience. She offers you a sheepish smile. I'll defer to you from here on. Where to next? You try the room directly across the hall first. No one answers, even though your knocks grow progressively louder until you're all but pounding on the door. I don't think anyone's home, Lita says. You ignore the snark in her tone. You know, the only other door at the floor is a bus. As all the doors are on the second. But when you finally give up, on the third. Ma Shanks is waiting for you when you finally descend to the living room. I don't know what happened. Oh, why? Ma Shanks says sternly. But if you're trying to fix it, do it quick. All my tenants got scared and packed up. Can go on much longer like this. And if you had to make it worse, she continues and opens her eyes shockingly wide. In the moment, she looks like every student school teacher you ever had and feared as a child. You will regret it. Go get it. Sorry, he just says once you're outside. I really thought that would be more fruitful. She glances down at your pockets. More fruitful for the investigation, I mean. By the way, if you're going to pawn that black cat statue, I'd wait a while. If we stole it recently, there'll be folks looking for it in pawn shops and auction houses. Laying low for a while will take the heat off. Professor bristles at the veil accusation. I work in the history department handling antiquities. Half our collection comes from pawn shops and auction houses. You think her indignation might be laid on a little thick. It is laid on a little thick. You keep the thought to yourself, but as far as you can tell, she's lying about something. It seems the good professor might not be so good after all. It's early afternoon now, a time of day between the lunch rush and the dinner rush. The shops are busy, but not so busy that you couldn't chat with the proprietors about anything suspicious they may have seen over the past few nights. The closest shops are the grocery store at the street corner, a small bakery a few doors down, and a flower cart on your side of the street. The flower vendor sees you coming from a mile away. He pushes himself out of a casual lounging position against his car and strides forward to meet you. You do not like to glint in his eye. Star-crossed lovers, the man warbles suddenly, delivering the land like an overdramatic prophet. Two people with true heart, united as one, unable to express their love under the world's harsh gaze. He leans in close, and his voice drops to a conspiratorial whisper. But I see the love you share, my friend, and it is beautiful. Out of nowhere, a flower appears in his hand, a single, perfect rose. He holds it up like a holy offering. 
solemnity drops over the man's face like a shutter over an open window. What do you want? he asks. His voice is as flat as his expression. And make it fast. These flowers won't last all day. Gone is the pomp and circumstance. The man standing before you now is nothing more than a shrewd businessman. I see lots of things, he says mildly. I can't be sure I've seen what you're talking about. It's a lot to remember. Professor Leader snorts. The vendor ignores her and lifts his eyebrows meaningfully at you. Hmm, timid or charm. How am I going about this? Go chase yourself, he says finally. He picks up the handles of his cart and wheels off and that's the direction without so much as a second glance. It's early afternoon now, a time of day between the lunch rush and the dinner rush. <laughs> uh, well, the gruff grocer. The gruff gr grocer meets you with a short wave, apparently more interested in the paper he's reading than his customers. It takes you a few tries to flag him down, and he's even grumpier when it becomes clear that you don't have to buy anything. The man sighs and leans back. First off, I don't want any trouble. He says, I had nothing to do with it. I don't know whether you're cops or mobsters, and I don't care. Whatever's going on at Marsh Shanks is none of my business. But, he says, leaning back in towards you, if you know who roughed up my shop last night, and I'm not saying it was you, tell him to lay off, all right? The grocer goes on, looking increasingly irritated. Looked like they let wild dogs loose in here or something. I had to slap a fresh coat of paint on to cover up the scratches. You glance at the walls of the shop, and sure enough, the fresh whitewash hides several long parallel divots in the wall. You think the grocer and exchange a meaningful look with Professor Leader on your way out. The beleaguered bigger. Hello, an exuberant man in a flowery apron calls from behind the counter. Welcome to Barry's Bakery. What can I help you with? He smiles, slips a little when you can explain that you aren't actually here for any baked goods. The man's face goes white. No, he says quickly. No, I didn't see anything. His white eyes dart between the two of you. The poor man looks like he's on the verge of a heart attack. You rush to comfort the baker, explaining very plainly that you aren't here to cause him any trouble. You just want to know if he's seen anything suspicious. No, he repeats, the color starting to come back to his cheeks. It seems the man has rediscovered his spine. Nothing. And even if I had, he says slowly with a splendid, steadfast gleam in his eye, I'll never tell you. You can count on that. You stumble, mystified, out of Barry's bakery. I'm fairly certain that man thought we were in the mob, Professor Leader muses. Well, let's try the flower vendor again. Hopefully explain your predicament that two upstanding citizens just trying to find a missing man and the vendor sighs caving. All right, all right, he says. I'll tell you what I know, but it isn't much. I wasn't even out here that night. 
from what I heard, though, a big ruckus went down. Sounds like maybe the guys who bumped off What's-His-Face came back last night, too. Roughed up a couple stores in the block. He turned the handles, puts the handles of his cart. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got better things to do than get mixed up in whatever's going on here. He starts to wheel his cart away. You're just about ready to give up. You're exhausted all your options. On top of that, it's getting dark. The sun will be setting soon. You and Professor Leader both agree that it'd be best to call it a day and recount the clues so far over dinner before finally turning in for the night. Excuse me. A really voice calls from around on your right. You look towards the voice and find a woman sitting in the mouth of an alleyway. She's only in her early thirties or early forties, but life has clearly not been kind to her. Wearing its ways on every line in her face. I'm sorry to bother you. But I hear you're looking for information, information about what happened at Ma Shanks. I'd be happy to help. She shakes the tin can at her feet. It barely makes a sound. She hasn't made much money today. She must be desperate. So you scrunch a few coins from your pocket and crouch down to toss them into the tin can. A smile stretches across the woman's face, revealing crowded, stained teeth. Thank you, she says earnestly. Then she draws into herself, her face going dark. Two nights ago, screaming woke me up, she says, wrapping her arms tightly around her knees. There was this awful ruckus, too. And then suddenly, it all stopped. And some thing fell out of the window at my shanks. It's not cold out, but she shivers nonetheless. You can't really blame her. And then, she says quickly, as if afraid to go on, he got up and it ran away. A shiver crawls its way up your spine. Came back, though, the woman whispers. He came back last night and roughed up the grocers. It'll be back tonight, too. Thank you, Lita says, settling a hand on the woman's shoulders. Please, stay safe tonight. You catch Lita darting thoughtful looks at you as you both walk to a nearby deli. She doesn't say anything, though, even though the sounds is a little unnerving. You decide against pushing her. Finally, settling at the deli over sandwiches and cups of soup, she speaks. That was good of you, she says quietly. Not everyone would have done it. Professor tilts her head and narrows her eyes thoughtfully. No, it wasn't. It wasn't on Greenchester, either. But I think like that came in a lot. More than you know. You fall silent and let the moment pass. Lita doesn't say anything in response, but she does look rather thoughtful for someone eating tomato soup and half a Reuben. So, Lita says once you're both finished eating, her expression is carefully neutral. The case, any thoughts? It's a lot to think about, but one subject in particular comes to mind. The scratchers in Ghana's room in the grosses, you say. There's no way Garden made those. I doubt any human good. Leah pushes her lips. And what do you think made them instead? A gut cuddling scream up to the air before you can answer. Leader's up and out of her seat before you can, the scream has fully faded away. It's all you can do to run after her. The streets of Cedar are in chaos. Most people seem to be running for safety, although a few are frozen in place by fear or confusion. The area is hardly packed, but even a dozen people can fill the street if they're frantic enough. Now that you're not behind the deli's glass window, you can hear more than just a scream. There are distant crunches and sounds and a metallic shrieking, like nails against a metal chalkboard. 
It's all coming from the direction of my shanks. You and Leah run the final corner and skid to a halt. There, amidst brick buildings, is a creature straight out of a nightmare. It's the sort of creature you're more familiar with than you'd like. Its form is twisted and ugly in a way that makes it hard to look. Black pustules bubbling up along its black curving over its shoulder to cover half its face. The rest of its flesh is discolored like its whole body has been bruised repeatedly. The ropey muscles underneath its mottled skin tense and shifts. The creature picks up a motor coach and throws it halfway down the street. Lita swears under her breath. You glance over and see that she isn't staring at the creature, but the alleyway directly behind it. There, crouched in the shadows, is the homeless woman who did her best to warn you about all of this. We have to get the thing away from Alice, Lita mutters. She looks at you. Her expression is grim, her eyes wide. Do you want to be the bait? Leader nods and starts off to the side of the creature's view. And then it's just you, a rampaging monster, and a few dozen feet of cobblestone street between you. The monster's mid-shaped head swings towards you. For something with, without easily discernible eyes, it certainly seems to know exactly where you are. Your sick fascination quickly takes a back seat to abject terror as the creature charges towards you. You get to the left, but not quickly enough. The monster's claws rake across your back. The horse's head knocks you across the street where you roll a s to a stop on the uneven cobblestones. The monster isn't done with you yet, though. You can hear it running across the street towards you. You fumble for the gun in your pocket and you draw it just as the monster reaches you. Monsters on you sooner than expected, and its massive claws bat you aside even as you pull the trigger, sending your shot wide and your body rolling across the ground. Every inch of your body hurts. You feel rather like an abused rag doll or a punching bag, and still the monster isn't done with you. You hear it closing in again, and there isn't time to ready your gun again. Something collides with with you from the side before the monster's claws can make contact. When I said bait, Lita hisses, I meant a quick distraction, not life-risking heroics. Over her shoulder, the monster is back for another mighty swing. Lita makes a wordless but impressively aggravated sound. She puts you aside and pulls a knife out of her skirt to deflect the creature's incoming blow. To your surprise, the monster reels back, clutching a now bubbling wound on its arm. I trust you won't tell the university about this, Lita says breathlessly, sparing you barely a glance before lunging forward to slice at the creature again. The creature makes a noise that could generally be interpreted as one of pain. It's honestly hard to differentiate between the sounds of various ear-splitting roars. The yell mostly just serves to set your teeth on edge. The monster makes another noise, a little quieter this time, and actually starts sloping away down the street, clutching its wounded arm. You and Leader both watch silently as the creature disappears down an open manhole. The two of you rush after it, but before you can descend into the sewers, the sound of a door opening behind you draws your attention. Mashanks comes marching out of the darkness and all lantern in one hand. Her face is as grumpy as you've ever seen it. She thrusts the lantern against your chest and you clutch at it refle reflexively. 
she stabs on Bonnie finger and the chest and says, Fix it. And then, with a final decisive nod, she turns and marches back down the street, leaving you alone with Professor Leader in the open manhole. The climb down into the sewers is long and tedious, but on the positive side, you made it to the bottom unharmed. It seems your fears of an ambush were greatly unfounded. The sewer tunnel spot is disgusting as you expected. Moss chains lantern casts an eerie orange glow across their running brick walls, sending cockroaches and rats scrambling back through the crevice, away from the light. You and leader settle into a companionable, if tense, silence. The threat of a sudden attack keeps you in age and occupies most of your thoughts. There's something itching at the front of your brain, though, and eventually your curiosity is too great to ignore. It gives you a wry grin. I knew you'd want to know more, she mutters. Well, no use hiding it now. She reaches into the folds of her skirt and pulls out the long obsidian knife. Now that it's not being used to fight off an oncoming monster, you can make it out in more detail. Strange symbols cover from the hilt to the tip of the blade, and part of the handle is wrapped in red cloth. In my line of work, studying the obscure corners of history, you hear about all sorts of things, she says. I may have gotten a little paranoid about encountering some of them, so I bought this, hoping that if I ever did run into something unnatural, I'd be able to defend myself. Ed... She adds, touching the turquoise brooch on her neck. This is supposed to be a protective charm. I don't know if it works or not, but it certainly hasn't hurt. A sudden, low rumbling noise makes the both of you freeze in your tracks. You turn your attention away from the knife toward the tunnel ahead, but it's empty. The only movement you can make out is a scurrying of rats and cockroaches. The noises echo slowly across the room breaks, and a few moments later, the sun comes again. This time, you can discern a pained note in the low groan. You exchange a brief look with leader and extinguish the lantern. There's a very dim light at the end of the tunnel, and it gets closer and closer. <sighs> Until suddenly, the tunnel opens up into a recessed, cavernous area where the tunnel intersects another. The dim light that led you here shines from a silver, silver grate in the ceiling, and what it is illuminating is a horror show. The walls are lined with piles and piles of mutilated rat corpses, along with a few larger ones that you refuse to scrutinize too well. The monster from the street above is curled up pathetically at the center of it all, surrounded by still, murky water. The moonlight coming through the grate cast bars of light across its mauled hide. Gashes from Leader's knife yawn wide across its arm. The edges of them seem to be hissing and letting off steam. Leader grabs your arm, shaking you from your horrified reverie. She points across the cavern to the largest pile of rats. You squint, and there, barely peeking out from the mound, is the corner of a book. There's something you should know, Leader whispers as the creature bellows in pain again. There's a reason that Dean was so vague about the stolen book. It's incredibly valuable. Rumored to have, well, supernatural powers. That's why I brought the knife with me during the investigation. Given everything we've seen tonight, I think it's pretty safe to say that the book, the Necronomicon, might be the real deal. And if it is, it might be able to help us kill that thing. She gives you a meaningful look. So I'm gonna run over and get it. And you can distract the thing while I do. She narrows her eyes, the corner of her lips cor lips quirking upwards. Properly this time. She does off without an answer, delicately still on the wall to the other side of the room. Sure, you can distract the monster with a shout, or by splashing some of the disgusting sewer water on it, but it seems distracted enough already by its injuries. If you can add to those injuries, it'd be like killing two parts of one stone, wouldn't it? 
you take aim at the creature's wounded arm. It's an easy shot. The monster isn't moving, other than to tremble with pain. And yet your hands are shaking. The shot goes ludicrously wide, piercing the far wall rather than its intended target. When you look back at the monster, it's staring directly at you. You startle so badly that you slip and fall down to this watery recess of the cavern toward the monster, which wastes no time in batting you aside with its claws. It seems that despite your best efforts, you're ultimately no match for a giant otherworldly monster. Even a wounded one. The creature is so close you can smell its breath. A foul necrotic stink that nearly makes you gag. It swells open wider and wider, and a low rumble builds in its throat. And then it freezes. Did it work? A voice calls from the end of the tunnel. You manage carefully past the still frozen monster, every corner of your mind screaming but it could start back to live at any moment, but it doesn't. I finally reached the cabin at the crossroads. Professor Leader stands near the far wall, flipping through the pages of a giant book, the Necronomicon. She looks up as you clamber down to meet her and grins. I think I have a way to kill that thing, she says. She holds out the book, now open to a page covered in obscure diagrams and characters written in dark red ink. Or what you hope is ink, anyway. It's a banishing ritual, she says. There's a feverish glint in her eyes. And if that last right worked, this one will work too. <sighs> okay, Lita says. I was left on the page. Most of the ritual is just a long chant, but there's one other thing we need. A ritual circle. It can be made of anything. It just has to stay in place while we banish the abomination. You guess about the cabin for anything of use, but in the end there's really only one resource available to you. There's hands a grim look later and hike up your sleeves. And then the two of you start to rearrange the piles of dead rats. The gruesome work takes what feels like an eternity, but finally, you step back from the completed circle. Hundreds of rats spiral out across the watery floors of the pattern in precise patterns. I have to reverse the effects of the other ritual first, Lita says. Her face is pale, but determined. We need to get the monster in the circle. You brace yourself as Lita reads page in the book, but it's not enough to prepare for you for the thunderous roar that follows. You barely have time to blink before the monster comes barreling out of the tunnel. It skews on the side of the cavern, breaking the ritual circle on its way down. Fix it! Leader cries, no longer chanting. It won't walk if the circle's broken! is no, either no longer injured, no longer cares about its own well-being. It plows towards you as you scramble toward the broken circle, but you duck and slide between its legs. The monster's momentum carries it into the wall and it makes a contact with a sickening crunch. A few of the boils along its back and side burst, spewing black liquid. You turn your attention to the circle. You fall to your knees in the murky water and shove the rows of dead rats back into place as best you can. The leader starts chanting. Behind you, the monster yanks itself free of the wall and turns its attention to the leader. You throw yourself to the side, launching bodily into the monster's flank. A few black pustules pop underneath you, both you and the monster go sprawling to the floor, almost exactly in the center of the ritual circle. The leader's chanting reaches a fever pitch. The monster's movement slow to a crawl. You throw yourself on top of it, knocking it onto its stomach, prone. 
The creature shudders with its entire body, and then its flesh starts to ripple. You watch with horror as the monster beneath you sizzles and warps, howling in pain as its body shrinks unevenly. Its skin loses its gray and purple hues, and the bows on its head burst and drain away. Steam, smoke, rises from every inch of its shifting form. And through it all, you keep the creature pinned to the ground, keeping it from breaking away to disrupt the ritual circle. That's when leaders finally finish chanting. All that's left of the monster is a man. You see on shaky legs, the man, who just moments ago had been a giant, thrashing beast, was naturally still. His skin is pale, almost waxy. Leader stumbles towards you and you jerk back reflexively. But Leader just approaches the limp man and carefully uses the toe of her boot to turn him over. The man's eyes, now visible, are completely lifeless, covered in a milky foam. His mouth is slack and white-lipped. This is not a man. It's a corpse. I already have to get a for sanity. I'm wondering if anyone else has noticed. strain is too much. A fragile human part of your mind breaks and gives way to insanity. Yeah, well, is that? Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I didn't make it. Not really surprised. Alright, um, remember to click like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, leave a comment in the description. If you want me to play this one again, maybe try somebody else, sacrificing somebody else. Right, thank you, have a great day.